Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Bashir Abdallah. Uh, I've been living in Burlington for about seven years with my wife. We have a three and a half year old daughter who uh, will be or will eventually be in the Burlington school system. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a bit of about my background and a few other things. I'll be perfectly honest. I, I really struggled thinking about what to say when I got here. I have no prepared notes. I figured I'd just wing it and just be honest about uh, my life. It's a lot easier to talk about your your lived experience uh, than it is to type up something and, and think through it. Um, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about my father and uh, share a little bit about his story and, and um, his struggle. And I think in, in light of the uh, theme of resistance, one thing that we Palestinians feel is important in, uh, in our approach to resistance is making sure that people recognize that we exist and that we are humans like anyone else. Um, I was flying home on Friday back from Nashville. I work down Nashville once a month. I get on a plane and go down there. And uh, just in the seat in front of me was uh, a younger woman and man who had met uh, another person from Melbourne, Australia, on the flight. And I was observing sort of their interaction with each other, and they were super excited to see each other. It's like, oh, you met someone, you know, in LaGuardia from Melbourne. How, you know, what are the chances, right? And where my mind went to is how unrealistic that scenario would be for my father. Because you know, they were talking about what suburb of Melbourne they lived in and, and who they knew that might have been similar. And for my father and for my family in general, that reality is not, is not possible. Um, my father was born in 1947 in a small town just outside of Jerusalem, 30 minutes um, west of Jerusalem called Beit Mahsir. Beit Mahsir is a small farming village. It's no longer in existence today. It's now renamed Beit Ma'ir. It's, under um, Israeli occupation. Um, and at the age of one, my father was a refugee. He and his family had to leave their home, like millions of other Palestinians had to. And they immigrated, uh, they refused rather, through um, and into Ramallah, uh, which is one of the bigger cities in Palestine, in the West Bank. Um, my family struggled quite a bit. My dad and his family, he was one of nine kids, only three survived, three of the children survived. Um, and when he became, I think when he was around 16 or 17, his father had died uh, it, as they were tra uh, traversing um, the desert to go to Jericho uh, where they were seeking work. Um, he died of a stroke. So at a very young age, my dad was thrust into a position where he didn't really have a childhood. Um, and I think when you're, when you're seeing conflict around the world, whether it's in Palestine or frankly anywhere, you naturally empathize with, or at least I do, empathize with what people are going through and the struggle that people tend to have. My father then um, decided to, at the age of 17, to move to Lebanon because there was no economic opportunities. Keep in mind, Palestinians were being pushed into a different place, and many of them had very little. In my case, my parents, they were farming. Uh, you know, all, all of their money came from farming, and so they moved from a place where they had some uh, steady income to a place where they had nothing. And so they were living in tents in and around Ramallah, and my father decided to move to Lebanon in, a, in an effort to work uh, and send money home to his family. Um, he spent a few years there, and um, like many Palestinians who left the, the, uh, the territory, uh, they moved all over the world. They moved to Australia and China and Barranquilla, Colombia and Chile. And in fact, there's a Palestinian soccer club in Chile today. Um, and here into the United States, of course. My father and his brother, his, his older brother, had moved to Colombia. My father instead went to Spain, spent four years in Valencia studying literature uh, first person in his family to go to college um, and became fluent in Spanish. In fact, we jokingly say he speaks Spanish better than he speaks Arabic and certainly English. Um, so he then um, moved to the U.S. Virgin Islands, which is where I grew up most of my years. It's kind of an odd place. Like, why, why would you guys move to the U.S. Virgin Islands of all, of all places? Um, but 
there's a pretty uh, large population of Palestinians living in the island of St. Croix. Um, and he started a business, and he started sending money home. Um, because at this time, for our family, and his family in particular, the idea of resistance wasn't a possibility. Like, protesting and, and um, trying to speak up about your background and, your, and where you come from, it, that's not the option in front of him. The option in front of him is sending money home to take care of your family, to simply put food on the table for your family. And so many people in our, in our world, uh, whether impacted by conflict or climate change, are struggling with very similar challenges. Um, he started a business, uh, and it was a bit of a grocery store, effectively, um, with a bit of a distribution business with his cousin. And they were quite successful. They grew the business really well within the first five years. Um, he met my mother through uh, a friend of his who had lived in St. Croix. My mother is also Palestinian, but her family lives in Jordan. And they got married. They had, um, I'm one of seven, so we we're a huge family. Um, my oldest brother was born and my mom was pregnant with my um, older brother, one of my older brothers, uh, when uh, tragedy struck again. My father uh, was shot. Um, his cousin, his business partner, was murdered in, in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And um, he lost everything. So he was in the hospital for nine, nine months. It's, it's almost uh, a miracle that he lived. He was shot directly in the face. Um, and somehow, some way, uh, it, it, he did not die. Um, his, his cousin, who was shot in the stomach, was being helicoptered to Puerto Rico, to San Juan, to the biggest hospital there in the hopes that they can save him. Uh, and sadly, he, he passed uh, in the helicopter ride over. I, I bring this up because I think that it's really important to put yourself in the psych psychology of someone who's gone through tragedy in their life. You've had your home taken from you. You've lost brothers and sisters as a result of fleeing. Um, you've lost your father. You've now lost your cousin and, and your business. And in spite of that, my father uh, fought hard to, to start again. They, were, they moved back to Jordan after my father was released from the hospital. And uh, they lived in Jordan for maybe six months when my dad realized that there's no way he can live in Jordan. At the time, Jordan was a, you know, today Jordan's a beautiful country and it's, uh, you know, got people from all across uh, uh, the Middle East that live there. But at the time, it was kind of backwards and, you know, having lived in the United States, my father wanted um, his kids to grow up in a, an environment where education was um, supported and promoted. Uh, and that was not necessarily the case in Jordan. So they moved to Staten Island, which is where I was born. Um, and my dad started selling mattresses and clothing out of the back of a van. He'd get up at five in the morning, uh, beat the rush hour traffic to make it into uh, Manhattan to buy goods and then back to uh, some highway off of uh, the uh, off of the Verrazano Bridge to sell uh, whatever he could to make money to rate, to support his family. Um, many people who've experienced conflict would probably fear be fearful of moving back to the place that the issue or the in his case the crime was committed. But he opted to move back to Saint Croix. In, uh, in 1986, when I was about four years old. And we went down there and we started a business again. Started another uh, you know, business selling paper and plastic products. And uh, 1989 rolls around, Hurricane Hugo hits the island, devastates our business again. Uh, and, and in spite of that, yet again, my father pers pers pushed through and, um, and and we live, and then you know, he he just he just said, you know, this is not going to be the end all be all. This is partly why I'm here. My family, uh, my dad sent us up to uh, upstate New York. We are my family's from a little town called Cherry Valley, New York, which is just outside of Cooperstown, if you're familiar with it. Um, and we we started to see this kind of perseverance in my father, and I think that that perseverance um, trickled down to us as kids. Um, we then moved back to Palestine uh, in 1995, and 
this was a time of relative peace. Um, there was certainly some conflict, but the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and the uh, Palestinian authorities um, uh, and the PLO's President Yasser Arafat had struck a peace deal with Bill Clinton and at the Camp David Accords, of course, and you know peace was on the horizon. And so we were there during a really important time in Palestinian history. It was the first time that we were uh, had the opportunity to self-governance, and so our you know, it was there when they came, when Yasser Arafat came in on a helicopter to Ramallah, and it was a, a really big thing for us. Um, and the Palestinian, the uh, the Israeli forces left the city of Ramallah, and the Palestinian police, the Palestinian Authority, took over. Um, but soon after that, uh, unfortunately, Yitzhak Rabin was assassinated, and he was a fairly moderate uh, politician. And what replaced him would become um, pretty. <coughs> pretty extreme politics uh, on the Israeli side. So things descended into chaos. Within a couple of years, we had to leave. Um, one point I, in, in all of this you know, story that I share with you, and I'm sure it might come as a shock, and you think to yourself, well, how does a family or a person put, go through so much? It's not always pretty. For us as kids, we felt the anger. We felt the guilt that my father, my parents had in general. We felt a lot of that. Um, and I think for me, a really important point that is not, often not talked about on the ugly side of conflict. I think as, as kids, we want our parents, we, our parents are our heroes. We looked up to them, we think of them in, in this really incredible capacity. But we also look past their flaws sometimes too. And for me, my father was quite angry. He was quite frustrated by what he had experienced um, personal. He was, yes, he persevered. He went through all that. Um, a part of my resistance is making sure that I don't do the same things for my daughter. In spite of the fact that I've gone through quite a bit my, in, my, in my own respective life, I don't want to do the same thing for my daughter that my father did for us. And I think, I think that in order to rebuild and in order to, in my case, work toward a lasting and free Palestine, it starts with being persevering through challenges and struggles, but it also means that I'm setting that up my daughter in a way that she's educated, that she appreciates her homeland, even though she may not be able to visit her homeland, that she will advocate and, and resist in her own respective ways, but that she's not compromised in any way, um, that she doesn't feel the pain and the, um, the challenges, the struggle of, of, of the pain that my father had to go through. And, and that's a really hard thing to realize. And I, I'm really blessed and fortunate that I have six brothers and sisters who see that as well. Um, because so many families today don't have, this, don't have the second to stop and think about those type of things. They are just doing and acting. And if you think about uh, the people of Gaza right now, that are going through what is, you know, one of the worst atrocities in, in modern history. Um, they're not they're not thinking about those same things. I I remember reading a stat before um, before October seventh and and the preceding conflict that something to the tune of seventy percent of children in Gaza have PTSD. Seventy percent. That was before they completely destroyed. Uh, the territory in all the cities and killed 32,000 people. Um, so how do you come back from something like that? Like how do, how do people move forward, right? Um, for me, I know, I know it sounds cliche, but I, I, try to, I try to, in spite of politics and people telling me one thing or the other, I try to live a life of love and, and respect and appreciation for anyone from any walk of life, whether you are Israeli or whether you are someone impacted by conflict. Um, because I think that I, I, can't, I can't think of a better way to approach life and to approach these difficult conversations and these difficult tasks. If we're screaming at one another, that's not gonna come to the type of result we want. For, for us as Palestinians, it's really important that um, that, that our existence is heard and seen, and, and part of that is by, in, in, you know, in the face of all this conflict and in the face of all this pain, that 
we elevate and rise ourselves above some of the expectations of what people think we're going to act like or, or behave or, or um, so, so yeah, that, that's sort of um, a little bit of my background and my family, particularly my father. Um, I'll, I'll, with a few minutes left, I'll open it up for any questions or thoughts that any of you all might have. Sorry, you guys were the first group. I think by the third group, that speech will be better. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, we have quite a bit of family uh, still there. Most of my family are in the West Bank, in and around Ramallah. Um, we do stay in touch with them. Um, we had some distant, fam distant family that was uh, unfortunately killed in Gaza. Um, but um, in addition to that, there's just been a lot of violence, settler violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. So many of them have, have been struggling with just how to navigate their days in, in, in light of what's happening. Yes? Well, it's not a question, but I just want to say I thought you did a good talking without any notes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> yes? Is your, is your wife also Palestinian? No, she's... Uh, she's um, American, uh, I think it's kind of funny because her half her family is like Canadian, the other half is, I think, Lithuanian, um, which immigrated here right around the same time that Ben, who did the Lost Mural Project, immigrated. So some interesting um, things there. Yes. Jordan, yeah. Jordan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why can't your family just like come here? Why can't my family from Palestine come here? Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of reasons. One, generally speaking, Israel's policy toward Palestinians of leaving the territory are very open. They want Palestinians to leave. Um, they, in fact, encourage it. In fact, you're even seeing, with respect to what's happening in Gaza, you know, part of the propaganda commentary that's happening is like, well, why won't Egypt take them in, right? It's like, no, Egypt should not have to take them in. You should stop dropping bombs, right? That's not, that's not the conversation. So in the case of my family, they don't want to come because they want to hold on to their homeland. There's fear that if you leave, you will lose your land. And we've seen that. And that's exactly what's happened. Um, the second thing is there, there's some limitations in immigration. Um, so there's a lot of young Palestinians who will come here to America and, and do a student visa and then try to stay on and work. But, but it's, it's quite limiting, too. So there's like a whole lottery system, much easier than, say, India or China, but, but still fairly difficult to even come here. So. Uh, when we left, oh. yeah. So, so it's interesting. We we overstayed our visa. So my my dad was born there. His intention was for us to move back there and stay there. We were not planning on coming back. Um, we overstayed our visa, you know, by six months. And if any of us got caught, we would have been deported, with or without our parents. So we we were stupid as kids. We were. I think I was in the eighth grade. We would go to Jerusalem with our US passports, if we got stopped, we could have been put on a plane back to New York without our parents. Um, and, but we wanted McDonald's, so like, you know, we had to take the risk. Um, so there was these things that we would do. And you know, us, us kids who had a US passport had more rights than Palestinians, than any other Palestinian who didn't have documentation to enter Jerusalem. Can I just I follow up? So it sounds like 
middle school age was around when you were last Yeah, year. yeah. What are some of the memories, like the, the happier memories you have of living in Samoa or in Norway? Oh, man. Um, if there are any. Yeah, no, there's a, lo there's a lot. I mean, I think one of the funniest things is we went to an English secondary school, and I don't know if anyone's into hip hop or rap here, but we went to English, we went to English secondary school, and you have these Palestinian Americans literally from all over the world. So my Arabic was broken, but it was English Arabic. But we had kids from Germany. Imagine me speaking to another Palestinian. He spoke predominantly German. But we would communicate in Arabic. But his Arabic was German broken. My Arabic was English broken. So we had this like weird thing. The, the reason I bring up rap is because this was right around the time of Tupac and Biggie. And, and we had these like kids from the West Coast who were Palestinian and kids from the East Coast who were Palestinian. And they were fighting over Tupac and Biggie in Palestine. I'm like, what is, like, I mean, I was an island boy, so we like, we like, like you know, uh, Bob Marley and whatnot, so I was like, what is going on here? You know, so it was a weird but funny experience to see that sort of thing. But this, this is what happens, like, you bring, you grow up somewhere, you bring, like, your reality to the situation, but. <laughs> yes. It's, it's funny you say that because I didn't know that my father was shot until I was 18 years old. He had all the signs of wounds from a shooting. I had no clue. My father would call it the accident. And essentially, St. Croix has 24% uh, unemployment. When I asked my father about it when I was 18 or 19, he told me that the reason this happened is because people have less and they came into our store and they tried to take money. It wasn't because the population of St. Croix was set up for success. St. Croix was a slave colony, you know? In fact, our high school was in an old slave plantation. Um, so, so it's amazing. I think for my father, I've seen racism on so little, on so little, you know? Just the pure hate in people's hearts on so very little. My father was literally shot by a black man. And instead of making that a racist thing in our family, he uses an opportunity to enlighten us about, you know, the, the challenges that other people face in their lives. You know, and I, and, I, and I admire him for that. I admire my mother for that as well. Because they never used, they never used what was happening in Palestine or what happened to him at any stage of his life to try to elicit hate in our hearts and our minds as we went through life as well. Um, so I would say, you know, I would say that no, it, w it was not necessarily a racist thing. In fact, in, in St. Croix, I felt, and I went to, you know, I was, I was the white kid in school. Um, I, I felt more supported by my Crucian brothers and sisters than frankly anywhere I'd ever lived or gone in my entire life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important things that, that we all can do is some, sometimes it's, it's honestly not listening to the adults in the room because the adults in the room have a tendency to tell you that this is a, you know, a complicated conflict that goes back and stretches thousands of years, which is complete and utter baloney. Um, this is a conflict of 70 plus years. People came in, took some other people's land, took 
access to all the aqueducts and water, uh, and the other people are resisting that. And violence has go been going back and forth since then. It's not that complicated. I think what, you, what I would encourage you all to do is try to keep an open mind about, about the conflict. Um, you know, have empathy for the children and the families that are, that are impacted by, by what's happening. Um, and at the same time, where it is most difficult for you all and for people in our world today is discerning truth from fa falsities. What is real and what is false? And I think that um, if you are led to believe that things are complicated and throw up your hands and say, well, I can't figure this out because it's too complicated, well, then that's exactly what people want you to believe. But if you actually dig in and read and understand uh, the perspective of Palestinians, I think you'll see the truth lying right there in front of you. Yeah, thank you. What was your father's name? Ghazi. What was it? Ghazi. Yeah. He goes by Gus. Gus. So, yeah, yeah. Is he still alive? He is. He's, uh, he turned 77 this year. Yeah, yeah he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an old guy. Uh, he, he actually doesn't know his birth date. Because he, he, his family, like, they, they had to flee their home, so they, um, and I guess birth dates back then weren't as <laughs> important, um, so he just made up a, he knew he was born in August of 47, so he just made up a day. So we don't really know if that's actually his birthday. If it was me, I would have probably picked four or five days in August and just <laughs> continue a celebration, but. Well, thank you all for listening. I really appreciate appreciate the questions. Hi, guys. How are you all? Good. OK. So um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of, you know, um, a little tiny story about how this story came up to be a story. So I. English is my third language, so I took English composition as my first class at CCV. And uh, as assignment was to write anything that you want to write. And I used that as a reflection of I wanted to write that story, right? the story of me leaving Bosnia. So what I did is I wrote the story, and then my professor really liked the story. And she's like, we're going to publish that story. We're going to send it. And to be honest, I didn't really know English. I didn't even know what publish means. I'm like, you know, she can do with my story whatever she wants, right? Then maybe after a month and a half, I received a phone call from someone saying that they're going to give me 1500 for this story to be published in some Townsend Foundation book. And again, I understood half. I thought it's like, oh, someone is just making joke out of story, la, la, la. And guess what? My teacher then explained to me that, yes, she sent the story, and I won 1,500 for this story. And you know, money was really good. At that time, 1,500 was kind of enough. I did edit this story a little bit, because if I kept it as it was, half of this you would not understand because it was like a, a Bosnian story with the English translation. And we don't have articles and all this. So it was just like, well. So I did kind of work on this story a little bit a few years ago. I'm like, oh, let me, let me redo this a little bit better since I hope that my English is a little bit better than it was then. So I'm just going to start. Um, I did prepare myself. You know, you never know. Sometimes I can just read it with no problem. Sometimes it just hit me, all these feelings, emotions. And you know what? That's OK. That's fine. So I'm just going to do my best and read the story. And then I will answer questions if you have any. So <clears throat> I was born in a small town in northern Bosnia. I grew up in a lovely family house with my mo father, mother, and my brother who was or is three years older than me. My parents were the best parents that someone could wish to have. They gave us everything we needed and supported us the best that they could. I was happy and satisfied with my life. In our neighborhood, there were 10 children around the same age. We played, we argued, and we grew up together. Our town was small, but large enough for us to enjoy ourselves. 
I remember our school, which had many windows that from outside looked like mirrors. It often gave off reflection of sunshine that made our school look like it was from gold. We call it golden school. In my happy town, the songs of a bird stopped only when snow came. But then, for us children, childhood was even more beautiful in, in winter, in a white snow-covered town. I enjoyed school. It was a big part of my life, and I loved exploring and learning new things. I loved reading and writing. After I finished high school, I went to college and studied mechanical engineering. After that, I got a degree in computer programming, and I worked on an oil refinery as a computer programmer in Kabul and Fortran computer languages. I was self-confident, proud of myself, and in 1990, I married my high school best friend. Then, in only one day, my beautiful life changed. In 1992, an evil named war came to my town and my country. It came to destroy my village, my country, making my friends sad and scaring my family and me. My beautiful town became dark and frightening. The sounds of singing birds and laughs of children were replaced with sounds of bombs, screaming and crying. My life and life of my family and friends changed. Nights with books and TV were replaced with nights in basements. Before the war, I thought of basement as a place for storage, for woods, and sometimes for mice. But the basement was the only safe place where the evil war did not come. The mice inside the basement were not enemies. The basement's darkness was safer than light outside. And the smell of humidity was better than the smell of explosion outside. My beautiful life changed in just one single day. We listened to the sound of bombs and explosions every day. The town was full of soldiers and strangers with guns. None of us knew who those strangers were and what they wanted in our town. Nothing was as before. Nobody trusted anyone else. Only one thing was necessary. Which side were you on, and what was your religion? School closed, buses didn't drive, workspaces were empty, and people, people were scared and hiding from each other. Most of them had the same question as me. Why? Why us? <clears throat> the war that started in my country was a religious war. My husband and I were two different religions, which meant we were supposed to be enemies and our parents were supposed to be enemies too. We had to choose to stay together, flee Bosnia, or, or return to our parents on each other's side. With the support of our parents, after a few months of living in a war, darkness, and fear, we decided to leave Bosnia. Two hours before the roads were closed, I needed to choose between my parents and my brother's family on one side and my husband on the other side. We only had two hours before roads would close again for tourists to leave a country. So they were the most two challenging hours of my life. I had to say goodbye to my family. <laughs> For me, the most difficult was to say goodbye to my brother's one and a half years old son. What will happen to him? When will I see him again? I felt like those questions were breaking my heart. The pain I felt inside of me is something that I will never forget, as you see. <clears throat> we fled Bosnia with the fear. The only place we could go was to my aunt in Germany. We were stopped several times by different armies. We were asked to get out of a car. At that point, our lives were in soldiers' hands. What would they do to us? Would they take me? Would they take my husband? Would they kill us both? Those thoughts were in our heads, and we were scared to death. We managed somehow to flee the country. How? Well, all that's another story. 
We drove for two days, we didn't talk, we didn't eat. We only cried and cried until our eyes were so red that they burned. We had only one wish, to return home. But we couldn't because we didn't have a home. We lived with my aunt for the first few months and decided to start life independently. It was hard to find a rooms or apartment without speaking German. We find a small room without, without furniture. 12 people lived in one house and shared the bath and the kitchen. After we find a place to live, we try to find jobs for my husband, which is electrical job, and for me, computer jobs. We tried to find a school to learn the language, but that was impossible. Sorry. Everyone we asked for help answered the same. You are only a refugee. The sentence we heard often. Refugees need to be happy, we gave them a home. We knew that, but we also knew that we had to pay for the safe home, and we needed a job and food, and we needed to send money back to Bosnia. After we learned a little bit of German language from a street, my husband found a job working outside as an electrician helper, and me. The only jobs I could get were cleaning toilets and floors, peeling potatoes, cleaning and ironing for German people, or any job the German people would never do. I knew I needed to work and send money to Bosnia to help our parents survive the war. I remember every day after I cleaned toilets, I cry. Every day, I felt increasingly disappointed and I felt like nobody. I worked with people who were uninterested in my story, not interested in my name, and didn't wanna know who I was. They only knew she's a refugee from Bosnia. I wish to tell them how nice my country was before the war. I hope to talk about my computer programming job. I wanted to, but I couldn't. Because first, I didn't speak language, and also I knew they would not understand, and they would not care. So I chose to stay silent and do what I had to do. Life was tough for us to Germany and more difficult for our families in Bosnia. We worried about them. We sent them money to survive the evil war. The only way for us to know what was happening in Bosnia was through the radio, and sometimes a phone call from my or my husband's parents. Every day we fear we will get the bad news. Every day we listen to the radio and hope that our families were still alive. We lived in Germany for a long, long five years. In 1993, our first son was born. In 96, our second son was born. In 1997, all Bosnian refugees had to leave Germany as soon as possible and go back home. Yeah, they wanted us to go home, but where was our home? We didn't have a home. Bosnia was separated by religion. We didn't want to separate. So our little family decided to move to USA. And it was scary. And again, similar situation. A new language, a new struggle to find a place to live, and again, over and over again. But this story has a different outcome. In this country, I was able to use my college diploma, go back to school to take some classes, and decided what I want to do with my life. My husband also could do, do that and work on the same job that he did in Bosnia. Today, he runs his own business. Our sons are 27 and 30 years old now, successful and happy adults. How did we get to where we are now? I may share that story with you some other time. But today, to conclude my story, I would like to share two major life pieces of advice from me to you. First, in life, you must fight. Work hard and believe in yourself. You have to love and respect yourself. And when life goes downhill, you have to find the strength to pick up a shattered pieces. Look at yourself in mirror and say to that person in the mirror, yes, you can do it because I love you and I believe in you. The second advice is this. War and life tra tragedies can rob you, take it everything from you, 
accept your education. Your degree is what you bring with you no matter where you go. It is a key that will open the door of new successful life for you. Thank you. Any questions for me, guys? Anything that you hear in the story, you want to wonder, know, ask, clarify. Let's go. We can do this. We can have conversation. Go ahead. Why did you choose teaching? Um, because I was a, so into being a mom and educating my own kids and be part of all that. And then, uh, as I said, education is a huge part of my life. And they decided at UVM, they said, I, you have so many credits in math. I thought, well, I give a shot. But I first was hired as a paraeducator just to see if I really like being around you guys. <laughs> and guess what? I loved it. So there you go. That's why I became a teacher. Yes? Is Bosnia still divided by religion? Yes. A little bit less of as it was right at the end of the war. Um, but still, if, if we would ever decide to go back, we would be living where my husband's family is or where my family is, two different regions. Um, and that's why we, what we had to leave. Um, because every time when we were even in the basement together, soldiers were looking for my husband. Or if, we, if I would be in a, where his parents are, the soldiers were looking for me. So it was very dangerous at that time to stay together. Um, and I don't regret that we left together. I think we made a good decision in our life. Yes? What does visiting look like now? Is it difficult? Is it something you do separately from your husband? No, we go together. Um, I always go every summer. I go last, it first lasted like four and a half years that I didn't go. But once I started going, I would go. Um, I think we can kind of go anywhere now in Bosnia. You know, people are, I don't want to say forgetting because you can't forget any, something like that, but more acceptable, I guess. That's how I would call. By beginning, it was a little bit sketchy to, you know, go everywhere, I guess. And uh, what's really interesting in Bosnia, by first name, you know, religion. Like if I have a name, my first name is Gordana, and that's more of international name. But my husband's name is Jasmine, and everyone would know what his religion is. So most people have a name that would just quickly, are you Serb? Are you Muslim? Are you, you know, Catholic? Like what religion? you in, so, yes. Do you talk to your family about your mom? Yes, I talk to my mom on, she knows how to use Viber, which is a way. Um, and I go every summer. I care about my mom and my dad. They're both alive, they're, they're 80 and 86. Um, and I take care of them, yes. Do your siblings still live in Bosnia? Yes, my brother actually got shot in a war, and um, yeah, that was difficult, but we got him back. So he's alive and happy, and lives close to my parents. Any other questions, guys?
Yes. You came to the U.S. Did you like know how to speak English? Or no. Oh, no. Um, in Bosnia, in the middle school and high school, like you have here, Spanish and German and all this, I actually did have English, right? But um, and then when you work as a programmer, then you really know a lot of words like save, move, remove, like the programming languages. But then you you don't walk around and speak like machine, right? So um, I, I learned English from like scratch, really. Um, and the words that we learn there in Bosnia, it's more like Great Brittany than you know here American English. Um, I learned English very fast because I. First of all, I like to talk. And second of all, yeah, I have to join conversation somehow. So, and second of all, I think that there is something that it's not that hard for me. So, um, and I like to read, so I read a lot. Um, I do use Grammarly, that follows me everywhere, and I love it. I love it. I just love it because, you know what? Even after 20 years, articles are still like missing here and there, right? So, but that's fine. You can't fix something if you don't know what's wrong with it. So, I get it. Yes. What are your uh, son's relationships like with um, with the war and with Bosnian like character development, heritage, and what's what that like for a generation now? They both speak language fluently. They write and read because that was my number one goal. Um, in, a, in our household, as soon as they came from school, the door, entrance door, was when you switch. And you are back to where we listen to Bosnian music, cook Bosnian food. Um, my son lives in New York, and when he calls me and he speaks English with me, I know someone is around. When he's alone, there is no question being asked, we speak Bosnian. They know a lot about religion, all different religion, what that family and what you need to call grandma for, what holidays one grandma celebrate, one holidays other grandma celebrate. I think they grew up as a very rich young adults knowing a lot and learn how to accept people no matter what. So um, they're nice. Two people like I, I'm proud of my boys. Um, they did go to Bosnia very often when they were little, but then when they reach age of these guys over here, I was kind of scared to bring them there because they would go out and then going out in Bosnian bars and it's a little bit different than going here. You know, there's not that many. I'm sorry. You know, like yeah, so. I asked them to stay here and go on vacation in San Francisco somewhere. Like, and I continue going to Bosnia alone or with my husband. Um, and now they really kind of almost adults. Um, one of my sons was two years ago. He went to visit. And um, my older one, he didn't go probably six years. And this, this is a year that he thinks he'll go. So they know a lot. I share a lot of stories, and they appreciate, I wanted to teach them that they appreciate people for who they are, good or bad, nothing else. Yes. Yes, I do. Because we lived in Bosnia like maybe 10 minutes apart, and I, we would go visit. And they, my mom and his mom, and you know, they, they stay friends, and they were on two different sides, and which were created for them. But as soon as war was over, we sat together again. And, you know, so it's interesting, but sad, sad, sad. Any war is really sad. Um, yeah, so. I don't know. I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I like being in the US. I really do. Um, and uh, the difference between me living in Germany, and I don't want to stereotype. Some people you know, like some other countries, and they're fine and happy in Germany. I was not. And you hear, hear, heard my reasons why I was not. But um, 
but the first, second day we arrived to U.S. and I, I remember I wanted to go buy, well, we have to buy milk and bread and, you know, and I had a little dictionary, no phones that you can search on Google, like, quickly, you know, a little dictionary, English, Bosnian, and so sour cream was not in dictionary. You know, all these ingredients I needed, honey was not in dictionary. And I'm like, I really wanna, and I like to cook and bake, I really wanna make that cake for my kid, the honey cake. So I walked in a supermarket, we were in Spokane, Washington. Um, and I'm not shy, I'm just like, I'm, I'm seriously not shy. So I walked in and I'm like, to one person who works there, I'm like zzzz, and, and like all these like brown and sweet, and I just throw on him like all words that describe honey. And he looks at me and he's like, and the only sentence I knew is I know speak English, right? I keep saying I know speak English, but I'm thinking but I know what I want, so I'm not gonna leave until someone gives me honey, right? So then another person came and third person came and I'm like zzz and brown and honey and sweet, like sweet, everything describing, I know honey, I, don't, I didn't know the word. So then one person said like, like this to me and he ran and he brought me like this big batch of honey. I think I had it for like three years, really. Like for, for that cake, you need like a few tablespoons, but that's okay. So then I was really happy I accomplished something. So I went to pay for the honey and for a few other things. And then I'm on a, you know, wanted to pay and the lady started talking to me. And in Germany, at least what I experienced, no one is talking to you. You mind your own business, that person mind their own business, pay and go. So she was talking to me and then I heard dress and I heard yellow and I heard sun. And I'm connecting these pieces, and I'm like, wait a second, she's talking about my dress. I had a yellow dress on me, and she's talking about outside is sunny. So she's having conversation, she doesn't even know me. That was like a shock for me. I'm like, first I thought I don't have enough money, then maybe I did something wrong, then I'm like, I don't know what she wants, right? And then she smiles, and I'm like, wow. And I had a one boy with me and other one in the car seat and you know I'm holding all this with the honey and all this and then one person behind me took the bag to help me with stuff and I'm like whoa look at this I came home and I could not wait to, to explain all this to my husband like we are in a place where people actually talk to you and they help you and they smile on you I love this I love it so that was a little piece of like wow wow this is this is awesome I can do this I can do this I can start over here um, but that the part that I talk to you about mirror, I share this with my students over and over again. I use that image in the mirror so much when, when I was in a Berlin, Germany, and nothing, like no work, no, no, I don't know if they're alive, I don't know anything. I'm like, I'm on a bottom of a bottom of a bottom. Like, what do I do? And seriously, kids, that mirror and that person, because I build that image of that person that I love, that I trust. Oh man, I got a lot of answers from that, that mirror and that person, that my best friend, me and me. Keep going, keep fighting. It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. Many, many times. So it's not made up. Miss Pobrich's analogy of a life, it's really that, that me, I connected myself with that mirror, with that person who really always kind of put me on. It's gonna be okay, keep fighting, keep working hard. And, um, and that's, that's why in my classes, you know if you're my student, or if I had you, or if I'm gonna have you working hard, is number one, not making excuses. Number two, go for it, is number three. That's all that we do, to do the best that we can. 
And I did best that I can. And you know what? I do feel the best I can feel. I have it all. Health, house, really nice husband, two healthy boys. I can't ask for more. In my boss, in my country, we're not going to wood. Do you all go not, do you know where Bosnia is, guys? All of you? Good. And I just want to say we have a few more minutes left to talk with Ms. Polish. Um, so yeah, please take advantage of this time. And uh, we'll be just a few minutes left, okay? Yes. How long did you stay in Bosnia before you and your husband uh, how 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 long in a war? How long we were? Well, maybe all together four and a half months in a war. And that was like four and a half years. Yes. Yes, we do. We do. We talk about. Um, how our lives would be like completely different and what would he do, what would I do? And we dated all high school um, and then we dated all college <laughs> and we just were meant to stay together and we are now married, what, I don't even know, 32 years. Um, I just take this as my destiny and I would not change that for anything in my life. It was hard, but um, it was worth all that. Yes? You mentioned cooking and baking a few times. Is there any dish or baked good that brings you a lot of joy to recreate for your family or for yourself? Yes. Um, in Bosnia, if you're a girl, then you, when you're 15, 16, you've got to learn how to cook. That's like you must, you know, you must know how to crochet, you must know how to, you know, all the things. And you know what, fine, I learned all that and I enjoy. Um, there is a specific uh, meal, it's called burek, that you can eat in any restaurant in Bosnia, where you have to make a very, very thin dough. Like a phyllo dough, but I'm making that phyllo, I'm like, pulling all around my island. And then you put meat or cheese and you roll and you eat. Um, and that takes time, but that brings that, that like joy of that dish is just what I would eat if I'm there now in some good restaurant. And I cook a lot of different food. Like I really like to explore, but you know, cakes or cookies that my mom taught me how to make, definitely I, I make. Um, I still learn from my mother. A few days ago, I couldn't make a cornbread that she makes and the way how she makes. So she was with me on a, they call it Weber, we call it Viber on, on FaceTime. And she was like, no, 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 you don't do that. No, you do that, no, no, now mix that. And so it was an interesting situation. But you know, in one hour, I, I got it all back. You know, in, in, uh, in, uh, it was not like my mother's, so, but that's okay. This summer, I'm going to probably from July, June or July, maybe five weeks to spend with my mom and dad. And, um, and every summer I would go and make sure they have a woods for winter, that they go see a doctor. I set up all appointments when I'm there. I drive them there, I drive them there. I drive her to spa. I drive like, I, I do so much for them that I do not want to regret anything when they one day gone. So I, I enjoy that a lot, so. Thank you so much guys for listening and being so like, yes. When you go back to Bosnia, do you ever have that feeling of like worriness or like scare? Uh, I'm not scared. I just have that emptiness of my friends are gone. Everything is gone. There are still buildings that you can see that war was in Bosnia. So I just feel sad that 
that war that didn't have any purpose at the end took maybe five, 10 years of people's lives. Like I, I wish, I wish it didn't happen and I wish I stay home and, but then again, you can't change the past. What I could do is focus on future and that's what I do. Thank you for asking for you know, a few questions to break the silence, I appreciate that. No problem. Thank you for listening. Thanks for coming, everybody. So I'm going to pass this around. And um, please take a look at it. It shows you some wooden synagogues. And you can just look at the back cover if you want. It just shows you the different designs. And um, they're actually very interesting. Take, you're welcome to leaf through while I'm also talking. Uh, but I'm, I just wanted you to see some of the back cover ones, because they're very, very interesting. So, welcome to the Lost Mule Project. My name is Aaron Goldberg. I've been working in the Lost Mule Project since 1986. Uh, the mural was sealed behind a wall in 1986 in an old building, which was this building. This is Chai Adam Synagogue. And this space here that's covered with snow is a, is a slate roof. And what you see here is the backside the, the outside of the slate roof, and what you're looking here is the inside of the slate roof. Yes? This is the only thing on that. This is the only one at the world, right? It's one of the few that's left in the world. That is right. Yeah. That is right. So, but if, if, you can imagine the, if you can imagine flipping this, so this is the outside covered with snow, you're looking at the inside of it. It's painted by this gentleman, whose name is Ben Zion Black. He is an immigrant from Lithuania. It's painted by him in 1910 inside of that synagogue building, the Chai Adam Synagogue. Ben Zion Black comes to Burlington in 1909. He spends six months painting the painting. He gets paid $200 for six months of work. That's about $5,000 in today's dollars. That's a lot of money in 1910. Um, ben Zion Black is a very interesting man. He is a poet. He is a playwright. He is a musician. He plays mandolin. He teaches a group of children like you, young kids, how to play mandolin as a mandolin band. Um, he, he, is a, he believes that Yiddish should be the, the language spoken by the Jewish people as opposed to Hebrew. Uh, he has an enormous Yiddish record collection, which at his death goes to the University of Vermont. Some of his poetry we have, some of the po his poetry uh, UVM has. He also has a very large library of almost 5,000 books. It also goes to the Montreal Public Library. Uh, he also collects postcards of life, uh, Jewish life and traditions and ceremonies and holidays and festivals and, and those postcards collections we have half and UVM has half and some of them are on display on our other case. The, uh, what you're looking at is his depiction of a story and the story is of the biblical tent of the tabernacle. And when, when the Israelites are freed as slaves from Egypt. They wander for 40 years in the desert, if you remember some of your story. And at that time, every night, they, they erect a tent of the tabernacles, which holds the Ten Commandments. And this mobile tent is meant to be God's space, a central, a, a, a central space for, um, we need one more chair. So they, they have this tent and the 12 tribes then camp in exact geographic locations in relationship to the mobile tent of the tabernacles. Now what's really interesting is that only the high priest could go into the tent. So why do you think Black might have painted it like this with open curtains? Mike? Anybody? Yes. If only, if only the high priest could go, why do you think he did it now this way? Yeah. Yes, to show others what might have been in it. And maybe he's saying that not, maybe, the, maybe it's not just for the high priest anymore. Maybe all of us can go into the, into the tent of the tabernacles. And that's how we have been thinking about this and conceiving about it. As the lost mural in this community, this is an open tent. And the, um, there's great symbolism in having an open tent. And the... The colors that you see are Black's depiction of the exact language of the book of the Deuteronomy and the book of, uh, of uh, Numbers. And it talks about the, the tent being made with, with, uh, with poles that carry it, which are wooden acacia wood poles. 
And black then substitutes those for uh, marble columns, which are an allusion to the temple in Jerusalem. And, but it talks with great specificity about the red, blue, and purple curtains that you see. And the, um, I also want to show you, while you're looking at a, an object that's 6,500 pounds standing, the mural itself, if you look at the top, at the bottom corner on the left here, see it's about half an inch of plaster on the wood on this side and then on this side. So it's extremely fragile. So it takes an enormous amount of people to figure out how to move the mural. But in, if you had been well, moving from the biblical times to forward, for thousands of years, Jews are all over the world and they're, they're building their synagogues, sometimes of stone, sometimes of brick, but mostly of wood, because wood was the most common and inexpensive uh, uh, element in, in, in nature for them to construct with. And so in the 1700s and the 1800s, you would have found hundreds and hundreds of wooden synagogues, many of them with interior paintings, mostly in Eastern Europe, including Poland, Croatia, Lithuania, Latvia, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and other countries. In Lithuania alone, the Center for Jewish Art in Israel tells us that there may have been over 700 wooden synagogues, of which 500 are estimated to have paintings. Now there's one left. There are several replicas. There are a few that, are, um, that have been moved to other locations, um, at, at, but they are mostly, you're looking at one of, the, uh, one of the authentic Lithuanian artistic, cultural, and historical heritage survivors. The, and how do we know about these, that these, about these synagogues if they, if they were burned or they were destroyed? So there are a few people who are artists or architects or photographers, depending upon their time and place in history, and they documented these. So we have written, we have written details from some people as to having seen what these paintings consisted of. Between World War I and World War II, there were, there were both a painter and an, and an architect and a photographer who found some of the drawings for these and, and actually documented hundreds of these. And, um, and many of these in Poland and, and Eastern Europe were painted with great joy. They, they had animals, they had symbols, and they're, they're designed to be a showcase as to make a divine space to convert, a, a divine space into both a joyful space and a, joy, and a space of celebration. So perhaps Black is with his, say, with his, remember he's coming out of the theater, maybe he's taking some of his theatrical sense and his colors, and he's, while he's using his biblical colors, he's also celebrating the fact that he is now in a place where he can celebrate freely, he can worship freely, he can teach his children whatever language he wishes, he can vote, he can, he, and, and, in the, and remember beginning in say the 1850s and 60s in Lithuania where he was, there were extraordinarily difficult pieces of legal legislation long before the Nazis took power. People would not, Jews could not travel freely, they could not worship freely, they could not teach their children language, they were prohibited from entering most occupations, their children at the age of 12, their male children, were drafted for a period of 25 years, forced conscription, which could then, that term, that, and then their, that term could then be extended by another term at the discretion of your commanding officer. So he is perhaps reveling in this idea of a, an immigrant being free here. And he does work, and he does write, and he does compose, and he, he finds two Yiddish book centers or language centers, he writes in the Yiddish magazines, he, is teach, he, is, he loves theater, he's bringing theater down from, uh, down from Montreal and up from, theater, up from New York. And so this is the only mural that he paints. He's a sign painter in Burlington. He, uh, for those of you who know where the Daily Planet is or behind El, El, Tor El Tortillo, I think, uh, that little alley, he has a business there on Center Street and he paints um, signs, uh, all kinds of signs, both letters and symbols, so you know, uh, fruit, and fruit baskets for fruit companies, and Maltec Cereal Girl for an old, old advertisement for, for, uh, for uh, Maltec Cereal, and um, the Green Mountain Bus Lines, and he does many of the, of the professional signs for doctors, dentists, lawyers. Uh, he works in the State House, especially his gold leaf. If you look very carefully, you'll see gold leaf all through the mural. Wherever you see the yellow and the oranges, you'll see gold uh, that's, that's also blended in. So it's really amazing that this is here because in, and the mural also, it's not only this, uh, this incredible artifact from our Jewish artistic heritage, but the fact that it's here and the fact that it survived in Burlington is also amazing. So it's painted in 1910. The, uh, building, the building stopped being used as a synagogue in 52. It's used for many, many businesses. By 1986, the only thing that's part left of the mural is this part, 
And so we take slides of it in 1986, thinking that we're never going to be able to get it, do anything with it. And in 2013, the building is sold again, and so we have the opportunity to start thinking about moving it. So we, have, we get a huge, a very large crew of people, and we, we figure out a plan to move it. There's great video of its move in 2015. And then we also, you know, but we, we didn't know at that time that COVID would hit. When COVID hits, while it's a plague on mankind, it's kind of another really interesting miracle for the mural because the building is sealed. So the conservators can work on the mural in 2019 and 20 and get it all cleaned of all of its grime and charcoal dust and dirt. And then in 2022, they, another team of, of, of uh, art restorers come in and they, they finish painting about 12% of the paint needs to be restored. So it is truly a miracle and it's moved, it's actually lifted in its steel case seven times to get to this, to get to this location. So where you're seeing it now, this is where the men would have been in this room and they would have been looking up at it at this level and the women and children would have been in a back gallery at the second floor level looking right at it. And when you go in the next room, take a look, you'll see, you'll see symbols of the lions, the lions of Judah. You'll see them in the ark that I've left open for you to show you how an ark looks like in the other room. And you'll also see a crown, which is this pre the symbol of the, priest, of the high priest. You'll see that as on the crowns of Torah scrolls and um, and you'll see that in the ark. So if you've, if you've been in that room yet, you've seen what, what, the, what the typeface, what it work, looks like, and scribes spend the entire time scribing those, those letters one by one. This kind of shows you the image of the Ten Commandments, which is in the Torah, and then in there you'll see the Torah scrolls itself. Any questions? Feel free to stand up and take a look behind the mural. You can see how the steel frame is welded. You can see this is actually the wooden beams here to move the entire roof structure. We had to move the entire roof structure in order to save this half an inch of plaster because we couldn't get the plaster off of the lab board. The move was one morning. It took about five hours to move it. It was scheduled for 13 hours, but it went... 6,500 pounds? 6,500. So it actually weighed more than there was another floor that went from corner to corner. It went from this corner to this corner so that it wouldn't move like this. And that added another 1,200 pounds. And there, there are pictures of that uh, in the other room too. Uh, if you look up on the display case and you go in that room, at the top of it there's pictures on top. And so it's, it's pretty astonishing. Not, not a crack. It was, it was moved with great precision. I'm sorry? Yeah, it is, it's another miracle of the mural. It's, it's quite amazing. In fact, it was moved with such precision, there was a little nail that was, in, that was not nailed in that was literally just resting from, with dirt and dust on one of the wooden beams on the back of it and it was not covered by the steel. That nail was moved seven times and we found it after we had lifted this up. So it was not jostled at all. And it was, if you look online, you'll see pictures and actually in the other room too. And I can show you this one too. Now you'll see, I'll pass some of these around. If you look at the top, if you look at the uh, top left picture here, you'll see that the mural was, it's got wood and pillows in front of it. You can take it, take it and pass it around. The top left. Yeah, top left. Wait, how long did it take to like, make this? To make the mural, it took him six months. And to, and to do the plan to get it to move here, it took a year and a half. <laughs> because we, on it, we had to build a building around the other building in order to work on the mural from the front and the back. And in this room, we had to put an I-beam in the ceiling and we had to knock out the doors and the windows in order to bring the steel case in. And then we had to lift it with chains to get up to its current height. But you're in a room that's designed as a museum now, so all the electronics that are on that back wall, they, they measure the heat, the humidity, the air conditioning in this room 24-7, and because the mural needs to be very carefully monitored for temperature in the room. What is the building, uh, the building that it came from? What is happening? It's now apartments. It was, it was converted to apartments in 1986 after being used as a synagogue from 1889 to uh, 1952. There was, there was. When I was, you remember that? So when I was in high school, the building, the building, uh, the last business that was in the building was Harry Wheel Carpet Master. And everybody used to go get their rolls of carpet or remnants from Harry Wheel Carpet Master. So if you were going to college, you would go down to Harry Wheel to get carpet remnants for your room to take to college. So I, Jeff and I remember going into the, the building now. Yes. Probably not people who are even Jewish. 
Yes, it's a, this, is a, this, is a, this is now acknowledged as an international artistic uh, remnant and, and piece of memory. Uh, so it's, it's not just a Jewish symbol of survival, it's a symbol of artistic survival. We have had people come from all over the world. It's pretty cool. And we've also been doing Zoom events around. So we've had, we have, we have, so we do Zoom events and we've done Zoom events in Lithuania, in Israel, um, in, um, uh, we have speakers who speak on behalf of the mural besides Jeff and myself, so we have historians. What I'll run you through is a couple of the objects here just to sort of express uh, something that I think will become self-evident. And that is that we cherish objects that remind us where we came from and who we are. It's just our culture. Uh, we, all, we see ourselves having been sort of lifted on the, on the proverbial shoulders of giants. And the stories I'll tell you really reflect what I think are actions by giants. So before I get into the story that Ms. Hurst has talked about, which is the story of the Holocaust, I want to talk a little bit about the origins of this community and give you, you a sense too. They're all asking what your name is. Oh, Jeff. This is Jeff. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And um, so what I want you to think about is this. The original people who came to Burlington, the original Jews who came to Burlington in the 1870s and 1880s, were people who were escaping persecution in Eastern Europe. Specifically, this contingent was from a place in Lithuania, a small community, small, small area. They came, they escaped. Remember, and I'm sure you've, you've, you've learned a lot about this, but the Jews in the 1870s and 80s were be finding themselves subject to attacks by the Tsars, uh, Cossacks, and by others, and the, more than half of the the Jews in Eastern Europe escaped to America. And these were some amongst them. And they came to Burlington initially because they came from a small village, a shtetl. They wanted something that was similar to what they had left behind. They weren't trying to run away from who they were. They were trying to find a place where they could continue to be who they were. And Burlington looked a lot like the village they had left behind with a river, the Whiskey River, and the fields, and everything that really was remarkable to them. Now the reason they came to Burlington is that they had, many of them had operated as peddlers. They came to this country with nothing and typically what they did is they acquired some objects. There was a peddler supply shop. They would get thread and needles and anything that they could go and basically walk around any area around the state and try and sell or to acquire any, any number of things. On Friday nights, because they were Orthodox Jews, their tradition dictated that on Friday nights they assemble. Ten males was the rule at that time. They assemble to pray. And they came to Burlington because a gentleman uh, on North Winooski Avenue, a French Canadian cabinet ma uh, ca coffin maker, allowed them to come on Friday nights and use his facility so that they could make prayers. So what I want to point to you in terms of objects here is the fact that while these people escaped with next to nothing, they carried things that really mattered to them. And some of those things we've, we've illustrated here because they were things like candlesticks. At the beginning of Sabbath on Friday night, they had to light the candles. At the end of Sabbath on Saturday nights, they had to light a twisted candle for a, a service and they had to smell spices to remind them of the beauty of life as they returned uh, to the world after Sabbath was over. They had prayer shawls, they had prayer uh, items, and all of that stuff here that I want you to look at comes from Europe. It belonged to them, and so we don't forget it. It's a reminder that they uh, were extraordinary. But the story, as Ms. Hurst told you, is really the story that I want to tell you, and that is the story pertaining to that hutch in the back. Now, that hutch came from Germany, specifically the Black Forest area, it was built in the 1930s and it belonged to a couple by the name of Harry and Irene Kahn. You can see Harry as a young man on his motorcycle. So it's a German couple who were basically recently married and young, but they were about to experience something that was truly traumatic in the 1930s. And that is from their small village, 
in, in, um, in the Black Forest town of Rexingham, they experienced something called Kristallnacht in 1938 in November, which was the beginning for all intents and purposes of the Nazi attempt to eradicate, to erase Jews. And what Kristallnacht was, was a nationwide endeavor inspired by the Nazis to have German people come out and burn synagogues and burn Jewish businesses and attack Jewish homes and basically terrorize the Jewish community. That, uh, Harry and Irene were part of that in their little village and that synagogue, which when you walk over there and you look at, that synagogue was burned. It wasn't destroyed, but it was burned. And all of the objects therein were taken out and were, were, were just dispensed with. Some were burned, some were destroyed, some, some disappeared. Well, Harry and Irene, after Kristallnacht, went back to their home, and sort of sat and did some serious thinking. Two nights later, a knock on the door. Harry opens the door and it's a policeman. But the good news is that it's a policeman that Harry knew. And it was a gentleman who said, as I was cleaning up the remnants of your synagogue, I came upon something that had not been destroyed, but had been thrown in the gutter. And I wanted to know if you wanted it. The object in the center of that hutch is called a Torah. It is the sacred five books of the Jewish Bible. It contains the story of the creation of the world in Adam and Eve, and it progresses to the death of Moses. Equally important, it contains all of the laws, the, the, the rules, to be a Jew is to be, you know, how to be kosher, how to set up your synagogue, how to pray, how to, all of that is contained within that sacred piece. That piece, incidentally, is handwritten. We have scribes who write that and it's done on a piece of animal skin parchment. They're very important to us. You will see a Torah, if you go to a synagogue anywhere in the world, you will see a Torah in an ark because it is, as we see it, the, the divine, it's the word that Moses was given from God that explains what, where and how Judy, Jews are supposed to behave. So needless to say, Harry took the Torah and as he was going, and this is a year later in 1939, they were escaping Germany as conditions worsened. They'd gone to Amsterdam, he had a friend. He gave the Torah and the, and the uh, silver um, wine cup. And the friend, so we were instructed, hid it from the Nazis. Don't forget, Amsterdam and, and uh, Holland was also, um, uh, had been uh, taken over by the Nazis. Eventually, after the war was over, Harry came back and he got that. He had relocated in Burlington, Vermont. Um, he had become a member of the congregation. He was a professor at the university and he gifted us those two objects. And we really cherished them. And eventually, uh, the Hutch came to this country as well after the 1940s and it's also become part of what, who we are. But there are two other objects that I draw your attention to. I want you to look at it. I want people it. to stand up. I want people, I'm going to shut up real quick. So two objects I'm going to reference real quick and then I want you to look at that or that or whatever you want. One object is a book. It comes from Germany. It was published in Germany in 1892. It was given to us by another couple who described the book burnings in Germany that they remembered that the Nazis conducted because the Germans again wanted to erase all Judaism from the face of the earth and so all Jewish books were taken out and burned. This one survived. Again, it's a survivor. We, we really, uh, we love it. The final piece on the far left is an interesting piece. It's another spice box but it is an extraordinarily elaborate piece that belonged to a very wealthy family in Czechoslovakia uh, by the name of, Fra um, I think it's, um, they're Bowers and I, I Block Bauer. So the Block Bauer family uh, basically, uh, when the Germans took over Czechoslovakia, they confiscated an abundance of Jewish wares. One individual in particular we learned later, Heydrich from the SS, was taking important objects, pieces of art, silver, anything, and basically was storing them for his own personal possession. When the war ended, eventually this particular piece was found and it was uh, ultimately auctioned off and one of our congregants bought it. So what I want you to appreciate is that that is our celebration, that is our acknowledgement of the Holocaust. I leave you, and I want you to look at the stuff, but I leave you with the notion of why do we, why do we preserve all of this stuff? Why do, why do we sort of hold on to it and, and hoard it? And the X answer is 
because it's a part of who we are. I mean, it's in our hearts. It's part of how we see ourselves. From those people who started, you know, having escaped and made something of themselves to the people that didn't, to the people ultimately that will, uh, your generation and generations to come who will keep it alive. So enough of me, take a look at stuff, um, ask me questions and however I can be helpful. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm very honored to be here, uh, to be given this opportunity to speak with you. And to be honest, you know, um, just listening Bashir, our former speaker, it kind of, you know, um, I felt um, exactly or almost like similar to mine. Um, before I begin to my stories, I want to say that my name is Noor Bole. And um, I was born in Somalia, but because of the civil war, my family fled from the country in 1990s. At the time, I was just a baby. I don't know anything about Somalia. Um, I grew up in Kenya, refugee came in Kenya. And um, in that, in Somalia, we lost uh, two of my siblings there during the war, because normally when war begins, you know, there's a lot of things that happens. And in the refugee camp, where we um, stayed it for a decade, we stayed in two different refugee camps, but in the dub is where I spent most of my childhood. In there, life was very difficult, extremely difficult. So a lot of the time when we hear refugees, you know, people don't really understand it. They just see people. But refugee normally is a people who flee from a country where they were just like, their life was very stable, and then they were just forced because of, for some reasons. And um, in that Didab camp, uh, where I grew up, um, you know, we didn't have any access to clean water, uh, uh, access to food, proper shelter, health care. It was just a chaos. But, you know, the one thing that I can think of that in that camp was a concentration camp, to be honest, because there was not any opportunity. But then later on, after living there for many years, uh, you know, the uncertain uh, future that we have, I remember that, you know, uh, people from the Western country coming there, like Australia, the United Kingdoms, um, the USA, French government come there. And then uh, they start process. Process means that they want to uh, know uh, the parent, uh, they want to know the families or the people that live in there and their situation, you know. Um, and that process goes many, many days or months uh, to do it. While that process is going, you are not allowed to go out of refugee camp because you may miss opportunity. Like I mentioned earlier, because the life in the refugee camp was difficult. So many people like fleed or went to somewhere in Kenya cities to just work, earn something for their family. Because a lot of the times like people there depend on the UNHCR, uh, the United Nations High Commissions, the food that they prov pr provide. And the food that they provide is not enough for a family to sustain, to be honest. Um, they will, if like example, if you're like a, um, a family of three, so each person will get maybe, they use kilos there, we use pounds here, but they use one kilo of maize, one kilo of flour, one kilo of um, um, porridge, um, a cup of oil, um, maybe one onion, and that's about it, no meat, no milk, none of that, and that, you are supposed to stretch it to 15 days, and, and which is very impossible to do it. So in that process, when that process is going on, um, is nothing's guaranteed. So you will go through, everybody will go through the process, but nothing guaranteed. It's not, you're not guaranteed to be given the opportunity to fly to, you know, uh, to French or, or, or France or, or America or United Kingdom or Australia. But there's a few family might be lucky to go there every time. It kind of reminds me 
uh, Black Friday, you know, Black Friday, where, you know, we, it happens once in like a year and people go there and like, you know, get whatever they want. And eventually that's about it. You have to wait next year again. Sorry, I'm getting called from the school. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, so that's what it reminds me, which is not really fair to treat a human being that way, you know? People will come, the government will come, they come with the process, uh, you know, um, and that process sometimes you will go through with different, you know, sectors, and then at the final process where you do your medical exam, that's like the final process, you will do your medical exam, and once you pass the medical exam, then you will be getting a ticket to fly to that whatever country, right? But sometimes, even though you may get a ticket to fly to different country, they won't just tell you that, oh, we're sorry, we're not really taking any, uh, we're not, we can't take it, we have to hold it back because there's a war going on in the country right now, we have to wait, or maybe there's election going on. But once that happened, most people, when they get a flight, they give everything that they have to the neighbors. So they have nothing left. A lot of people get traumatized by that. Like, there was, I have a witness, but there was like rumors going on that people hanged themselves for that reason, because they have nothing left. So it's very, like, very, very sad. So my family and I, we stayed in the refugee camp in the dub uh, for 10 years. And then after that 10 years, for example, they told us that it's time for you guys to fly. So we adjusted there. For me, I adjusted because I know nothing else. That's where I knew. That's where I grew up. I was there since I was a baby. So that was like everything that I knew. And we finally get a process. We were, we were brought to a place uh, or another camp called Kakuma, Kakuma refugee camp, where there was millions of refugees lived there. Like just so many refugees from everywhere from Sudan, Eletri, Tobia, Somalia, everywhere, Congo, There's just too many people. It was so diverse. In the dub, there was not many people like that. There was not, it was not as diverse. There was uh, maybe two blocks, we call them blocks or sections of Sudanese people lived. There was too many Somalias. Somali people lived there, Somalia and Somali Bantu people lived there. Um, and a little bit of Ethiopians and not, not that much. But in, in, in Kakuma, it was just large. It was large, and the people that lived there, they were struggling more than we were struggling. So in that camp, we spent two more years, in two more years there, that our parents didn't know where to start, where to begin. So I remember that my brother and I, we started making bricks for families, and we sell them for one shilling, each brick. You make everything yourself, it's just from the sand. They have right, nice, rich uh, you know, soil there, so you can make bricks. And my brother and I, we start doing that to just you know, uh, contribute into the, uh, into the family. We did that for some, quite some time, and that kind of brings some you know, uh, food into, into the table. But the thing is that after just living there two years, we got a process to fly to America. We were so excited. I remember um, the thing is that what they do is that we already, we already went through a process in, 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 in the dub, but in Kakuma, this was the second process. So what they do is they select one person from your family. It doesn't matter how old that person is. In this case, in my family, it, it happened to be me. <laughs> that was the, like the last thing my mom wanted, <laughs> to be selected me, because I was just more like, um, I was more like an uh, independent person, but more like, more like um, I would say, um, made my decision myself most of the time. Like, I was, I was different from the rest of my family. Like, for example, I was not going to school there because the school there is way different than the one that we go here. Over there, there was physical discipline, and I don't like sticks, I'm not good with it. So, in, in, and I figured out something that, you know, during the school day, I just go to the market where there was so maybe everybody comes there to watch TV, a movie. And then when the students was released, I used to go home just exact on time. Don't do that. That's what I used to do, but don't do that, right? <laughs> so um, they selected me, and then they only wanted me. And then the whole family come with me, but they can't get in there. They're just waiting. They're just like, they were so vulnerable. They're just like waiting outside to hear the news because you can, one single mistake I make, that's it like the flight will be canceled, right? So I went in there, and then there was uh, one black American that works for the INS, 
He was there in, in the table. He had a Somali interpreter. And then, so when he saw me, he was already doing paperwork. He was already doing paperwork. And then when he was doing his paperwork, I was so nervous, shaking, standing like this, like I remember like yesterday. And then the interpreter was asked to just leave. And that made me even more nervous because I, 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 was not, I didn't know how to speak English at the time. So. And then this guy was just looking at me, doing all the paperwork, and he says, if you go to America, what are you going to do? Of course I understand that. I was always, I, I used to watch American movies like John Rambo. That was my favorite movie back then. <laughs> so <laughs> I say football and it's cool. That's it. There was not any sentence followed with that, you know? Football, and football meant not American football, soccer, right? Soccer. So we call it football. Football and it's cool, I said. He says, he says, okay, you're done. And I'm standing there. I don't know what he's talking about. I'm just there, standing. He says, no, you, you're done, you're good to go. And then because he was feeling, everything was handwritten that back then. It was not any computer, so everything was handwritten. And then he lifted his head up and he says, you're good to go. And I left. And then I told my parents, they're like, no, this is impossible. You know, they were confused. They're like, no, this no, it doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't think we are going to America now. It's all done. They were confused. They were worried. And I was just like, I was nervous myself. I, I thought I made mistakes there. I was, not, I was not sure. But three days later, we get our flight up. They were excited. <laughs> so we, were, uh, we flew to uh, Kakuma Refugee Camp to Nairobi. This is in 2004. From Nairobi to New York City. From New York City to Vermont. And then we came here. We finally made it here. And then that's when I uh, promised my mother that I would be learning school. I would be going to school and I would be good at students. And I started as a freshman here at BHS. And then at the time, of course, English was a problem, right? Um, I speak two other languages and two and a half, half languages. I speak, I was fluent in Somalia and Mai Mai, also a little bit Swahili. I didn't go to school to learn Swahili. I was just, I just learned in the streets. And that's the beautiful, of, you know, that's the beauty of diversity, right? You just learn things without even trying. So when I came to BHS, I didn't know anything um, where to start. And um, we started as, you know, English second language learners, EL class. Miss Plasen was my first teacher that I met there. She's sitting right there, <laughs> right behind you. <laughs> and I know that, you know, at the beginning of the school, everybody's having fun, socializing. I'm just standing like this. And I remember Miss Plasen came right next to me, standing with me like this to accompany me, you know. And I needed that time. I just didn't know how to express her back. <laughs> so there, from there, um, I start going to school. Um, I start to speak English very fast because I was in varsity soccer, you know, team. Uh, it was not a problem speaking English. I catch the language very quickly. And um, later on, I start to learn how to write. As you know, if you, if you like, I missed the 12 year of uh, language. So as you know that, I don't know what elementary is, kindergarten is, um, what do you call it, middle school is. I, I have no idea what that is. I never experienced. So fr freshman was my first like, you know, a uh, formal schooling. So as you know, uh, the struggle there. I had to work very hard. Um, and then in uh, 2008, I graduated, and I noticed that, you know, um, I was not ready to go to college. I was not ready to go to college. So what I did, um, I signed up for CCV. I signed up for CCV, and I t took, like, non-college credit classes for a whole year. And after that, I took what is called Acaplacer test. But to begin, like, to be honest, like, I was very good at soccer player at BHS, and I had a dream to go to UVM to play for them. But because of the SAT test, I could not pass, and they told me that that was required. So some of my, you know, teammates who were on the bench end up going to UVM and playing, you know, following their dreams. That was the saddest thing that I, you know, I can, you know, uh, look back at it, because, uh, you know, I understand how uh, powerful education can be. Um, so, but when I went to CCV, um, I, I, I stayed there for a whole year. This is non-college credit classes, by the way. I know that many students will not, don't want to do that. So after that, I took a Acaplacer test. The Acaplacer test will tell you if you're ready for college. So I, I, I did very well on that. My teachers, they did a referrals and what I need to take, what class I need to take next. So I ended up at the Northern University of, um, uh, Northern University of Vermont where actually I played soccer. I had an injury first year, but I was the rookie of the year there as well. Uh, and um, from there, 
uh, you know, Jesse was the head coach back then in the UVM. He contacted me. He's like, hey, you are doing great. We want you at UVM. But then I fall in love at that college, you know, Northern University. The coach was a really amazing guy. He always checked on me. He always sent it, uh, you know, uh, the team captains to help me with my homework. I, you know, I put my education first and I thought that was the best uh, at the time for me. I said, no, I want to stay here. I want to just continue playing here and focus on my education because I didn't want to be a UVM, not, you know, fall behind. So I stayed it there. I decided to stay there. One of the things, though, that really, um, that made me very, very uh, proud was that when I went to uh, Northern University, I know that at least uh, Ms. Blasen will know this, but maybe 18 students graduated in 2008. And those 18 students that graduated, I remember that I was the only one who went to college from our community at the time. And in uh, and, and 2012, I got my associate degree in health science. And this was amazing because I, always, because I was always into the sport. I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to become a physical therapist. That was my dream always. Since I, I had a lot of injuries as well, I had ACL injuries and all that stuff. So I wanted to focus on those dreams. So when I graduated, I remember the whole community coming there. Because to be honest, my parents thought that if you graduate from high school, that was it. There was not any more things to do. So this is something that I advocated for myself. I learned it, that there's a college, there's a like, uh, you know, university out there, uh, that education continues, it doesn't stop, right? So I went there, I graduated, and it was, the whole community came, and um, that was a door for everybody else in our community, even though I was the first. We have at least like 100 students in our community right now that went to universities, that are doing social works, that they're teachers everywhere. That's like just a door. We have a police, cops, nurses, so our community has grown. I mean, we, I, this America right here in Vermont, I lived here for 20 years. This, like the, this place right here is the longest I've ever been. 20 years you were, you were not born, right? So I'm more American than you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, the thing is that education is very powerful. And you know, even though that our, our parents lived in a comfortable life in Somalia, but they lost everything, uh, many people uh, lost their life, you know, there was not, like, they, they didn't shy to restart again life, right? We continued to live and to exist in this world. Um, what I want to say is that, you know, in this life, only you can stop you. Only you can stop you. If you want to do something in this life, as, as, as long as the positive things, you have nothing to lose. That's one thing I learned. And even though I'm talking to you right now, I, I'm a still a student. I take class, neurodevelopment, disability class, uh, through Vermont Land University. I take that class right now. And I have kids, wife, and um, work, I have three jobs. VHS is one of my jobs, but I have two other jobs. I also do, you know, mental health screenings. And um, someone who just learned English here, worked hard, and um, uh, went to college. But then at the same time, not just that, I was given an opportunity to do screenings, mental health screenings, substance use screenings. Expert is what I do, screening brief intervention, referral to treatments. I happened to be given, a, uh, you know, uh, to go to North American Health Refugee Conference in Toronto. I went with uh, Dr. Mercedes Avila and also Dr. Green here. And I was able to give a speech to, um, you know, people that hold the doctors. You know why? Because my story is different than theirs. A lot of the time, like, we want to be someone, right? We want to be someone else other than us. But what we don't understand that everybody's unique. You have your own story. You are important. I felt like, and I believe that the reason sometimes is, um, society is falling apart is that many of us, many of us want to be someone else. Or many of us, like, you have a dream and somebody tells you that you cannot do that. You see, I was a very stubborn kid. Like, when people tell me that I cannot do that, I cannot achieve that, I just make sure that I prove them wrong. I work hard. It motivates me. 
Today, if I know if my kid, I said, you cannot do that, he will believe it. So it's very important. You tell me I cannot do that, I'll show you I'll do that. It's a different, right? I grew up in a different world. But I want to tell you a funny story before I give you a chance. Do we have time? Okay, 30 minutes never enough when I tell you stories. <laughs> so I have a funny story. I think that I feel that like uh, for me to stand in front of people and talk is like it's like it's just part of me. I wanted to do that before I even speak in English. I wanted to tell a story to American people before I started speaking English fluent. Ms. Pleasant, my witness. 2008, I wrote an essay for the graduation, right? But I was not very popular in the school, so not, I don't think many people voted for me <laughs> to stand in front of them. <laughs> but Ms. Pleasant was always genius, and I, 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 you know, I'm very grateful about her. She read my essay, she edited it, and she says, no, I have, you know, I have an idea. So tomorrow's graduation day, Today's Friday, we'll go to North Beach, North Beach, where it's beautiful. You know, June is always beautiful there. We'll go there, and then I make sure that I bring everybody, all the Yale you know, students, they will be there, and you will give your speech there. And I said, of course, I will love this. So we went there, I give my speech there. But one of the things that is stuck in my head that I still remember today is that me saying that I have a dream. Someday, I, I'd rather come back to BHS and teach. I did not know. I did not know like, what I wanted to teach. But I know that I was inspired by the Martin Luther King Day to say I have a dream. <laughs> but you know what? Dream does come true, though. Because I did come back to BHS. And I, I, had, the chance, I had the chance to teach my teachers about my culture, about the Somali culture, how we do things. The African time, if you hear that. I'll tell you, if I tell you, like, hey, I'll meet you there at 10 o'clock, that means I'll meet you there at 11. <laughs> that's, that's what, you know, these things, like, I had to teach the, like, the teachers. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, you have to be patient with this, you know, because time means nothing to us. When you live in a refugee camp, there's nothing you can do. There's not a lot of opportunity. But over here, you have a lot of, you know, opportunities. Like, if you tell, like, Nurdin today, I'll meet you there, sorry. You tell him, I'll meet you there at 10 o'clock, he will meet you at 10 o'clock there. Because he understands the importance of time. He's a student, right? He learned, we grow, right? But guys, that dream come through. I'll be graduating at the end of you know, this month. I'll be getting my certificate through UVM. And um, thank you, thank you. I just want to say, you know, sky is the limit. Don't let anybody tell you that you cannot do things. You have a dream, um, and, and if you share your dream to somebody else before you begin, they may discourage you, right? Make sure that you're asking somebody to help you with it. You say, I'm doing this, and I want to continue. Can you help me with it? Don't say, like, you think it's a good idea if I do this. Don't say that. I know some people will just say, no, that's too much. How can you do this? How can you manage this? Well, I have a three job right now. And I go to school. And I have a kids that play soccer. They love it. I have to take them to soccer. Every single day, if we don't have practice, they want me to take it outside, play with them. I manage all those. It's a doable. You only feel like you can't do things because it's all about in our mind. It's all about in our mind. What I want to say that Garvey said, Marco Garvey said that with the confidence, with the confidence, you're already winning before you started. So have confidence. I'll end it by there. Thank you. Sure, they can. That way people can move a little bit, and then if you want to ask more questions, I'd encourage you to go up and shake his hand and thank him for being here. So at least go up and say thank you, and if you want to ask any questions, you can ask him. Sure. One of the things I want to add is, like, last year I came here. It was my first time. I know some students, they send questions. 
always do that if you don't feel you know talking right now if you want that or if you I met a couple of students also they were doing project they come and meet me always feel free I'm always at the liaison office thank you Okay. Can you all say Tashi the Lake? Tashi the Lake? Yeah. So, like Kunichiwa, maybe like Namaste, maybe like, what is it, Nihauma? I don't know. But as a Tibetan, we say Tashi the Lake. So, Tashi Delek to all of you, and it's a great honor for me to be here, to be sharing this very precious time with uh, all of you. Uh, my name is Mikma Tsering. Uh, I'm born in Tibet, let's say raised in India, and now serving in United States of America. My story is very simple. But yet, if you, you know, chase me with the right perception or perspective, you might have something to take with you, you know, take with you home after this discussion. So we only have 30 minutes and time is very special. Please be with me. Please be with me 100%. And I will take you to some kind of a journey, which is what I call the journey of my life. So I was born in a small village called Thingri. Thingri is in the western part of Tibet. So if I kind of try to, you know, make a picture of that, the life in Tibet, when I was born, is something like this. There was no tape water. There was no electricity. There is a river flowing right in front of the village. And every living species shares that river. If I'm drinking water here, a cow might be drinking water somewhere up there, or maybe a yak might be drinking the same water up there. So that is how we share the nature. Uh, there is no trash or recycling or uh, what do you call it? Compost or anything like that. Everything which, which we use, 
will be reused and there is no trash. So there is a very beautiful harmony or very beautiful balance. Like even the human waste or the cow dungs, all of those things are also very, very useful. So we keep it in a small house, store it for a year, and when it's time for us to prepare the field, we take it out to the field and manure the field. So that's the village where I was born. And then when I was eight years old, something happened and I have to leave my family, my village, everything. And I have to come to India. So long story short, the most painful part was to say goodbye. To know that you are not going to see them again, again for a very, very long time. And not to know what is going to happen with me, without them. I also remember the time when I was put under the seat of a bus. My body was squeezed and it was very uncomfortable and painful, but I cannot make any noise. Because that time, I was kind of smuggled out through the border. And that's the only way. If I tell you a little bit about the background, China invaded Tibet in 1959. And Tibet lost, Tibetans lost their basic human rights. The rights to religion, rights to speech, and then rights to education. Since the parents know that the only way the kids can get educated well is by just smuggling their kids, taking all the pain making this very, very difficult decision in their life. So if you are wondering why he is being smuggled, uh, that is the reason. And then, by the grace of Dalai Lama, we have a school in India. Does anyone know Dalai Lama? Is there anyone here who do not know Dalai Lama? Okay, so Dalai Lama is the uh, spiritual leader of all the Tibetans, inside and outside Tibet. Dalai Lama used to be both the political and spiritual leader of the Tibetans. But now that Dalai Lama is 86 years old, he retired from his political responsibility and now he is the spiritual leader of the Tibetans. But to Tibetans, if I be frank, to every Tibetan, Dalai Lama is like a god. It is because of him and his grace that Tibetans are able to start everything all over again, even in exile. So whatever monastery, whatever school, whatever settlement, whatever is destroyed in Tibet, Dalai Lama took the responsibility to rebuild everything in India. Now we have monasteries in India, we have schools in India, we have Tibetan settlements in India, we have every thing that we used to have in Tibet, except the land. So Dalai Lama is not an ordinary person to the Tibetans. Now, because of his grace, I told you there is a school called Tibetan Children's Village, and that school became my school and my home. 
that is a boarding school. I was eight years old when I was admitted in that school. And I have not seen my parents for 10 long years. So that school, when I first started, since we are talking about resistance and resilience, when I first started, the first few days are the longest and nights even more longer. There is nothing you can do now. Your parents are gone. You are left there. And if you think you have a choice, you don't. And then there are people who like you. There are people who will not like you. But at least you have food, shelter, clothing to start with. Right? So just like that, I have started my new life. And then, slowly and slowly, with all those pain, like I used to always find a corner, cry myself out. I used to hide under the blanket, cry and cry and cry, because I was missing my parents, my friends. But that's the only thing I can do. And after a while, I got tired. And then I said, oh, it's, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do like this now. Then slowly started making friends, started having more fun, get, get yourself in uh, to participate in soccer or basketball or volleyball. And then after a while, I saw myself flying. I was actually living, I was actually having fun. So it takes a while, but you always come out of it. Then my school life was so much fun, I didn't even know how 12 years passed by. And then the time for me to leave the school came. That school is not just a school for me, that's my home. I left my own home, I found a new home, now it's time for me to leave that home and I have no clue about the outside world, frankly speaking. And then, after graduating class 12, I have to go find a college. One college gave me full scholarship. It is called the Regional Institute of Education. And that college is in the uh, southeastern part of India, in a state called Odisha. Uh, the capital city of the state is Bhubaneswar, and that's, the, that's where the college is. So for four years, so the same thing happens. Now you have to start all over again. You are in a new place with new people. This time, all of your college mates are Indians, and you are the only Tibetan. So there is language barrier, there is cultural barrier, there is new environmental uh, you know, adaptations that you have to make. The place was so hot and my school was on a hill station. So college life, even if you don't do anything and with the fan full going, still you sweat. That's how hot the place is. And then since your friends are all Indians and you are only, you are like a white crow. They are all like staring at you, you know? And it was so uncomfortable that if I have a choice, if I have a choice, I might have left. The food is different, everything is different. But I have no one, remember? My parents are back in Tibet, and I have no one to go to. And that's when you have to resist. So I have to accept everything that is coming towards me, and then start living it, and start making it your own. And then the same thing happened. I was so surprised. After one year, I have friends, 
And then I saw myself all over, all over the college, competing with soccer games, basketballs, cricket, uh, participating in uh, cultural competitions. And uh, the one thing that I'm very proud is I started Tibetan dance in that college. And I competed with the other states of the India, uh, other states in the college, and we stood second. So now, I mean, one day at a time, maybe weeks or months or years, you get, you, get, you, you kind of know how to live. So four years, third year, fourth year, so much fun, college life, doing all the crazy things. And then again the time comes, college life ends, time to get separated from the beautiful friends you made, and now time to start a life, another life. So after finishing college, I went back to serve my own school, and I started uh, I was a science teacher for middle school, and I taught class eight, class 10 most of the time. I also have to teach math. Now that I was so proud, I'm serving my school back, <clears throat> I really got carried away. But in between, I met my wife, and I have two beautiful daughters, and then I thought, this is it, my wife, was an accountant, I was a school science teacher, uh, we had a good life. And I kind of decided, okay, this is it, this is my life. This is now finally where I belong, maybe this is it. And then suddenly the call came from America. My wife's sister, she went to America a long time back. And now this is a family reunion. All the paperwork are done, and her time for the interview came. And along with my wife, I, my name was there, my daughter's name was there. So all four of us, we went with no expectation at all that we will get it. I didn't even tell my friends when I went for the interview because I have no expectation at all. I know I'm doing this for the sake of her sister-in-law, who did a lot of work, but that was actually that time impossible. But for some reason, all four of us got okay to go to America. And then now, everything changed. I do not know what's gonna happen with us. I thought we have a good life here, Everything is going good, and now it's time to go to America. And then again, you start over from zero. And then it's been 10 years now, more than 10 years. I still remember those days, my first few days. I still remember the experience of being a cashier in Walgreens. I remember how, how easily people get mad when you do not have the answers. And how can you expect answers from me? I just came from India. I do not even know the, the word I'll. I do not know anything. But holding myself in there, even though I have to call the manager again and again for help, I was holding myself in there because I have a family to serve. And then days, weeks, and then I learned. Through that job, I learned how shopping is done in America. And then I got a better job. This was 725. That's how much I was paid per hour. Seven dollars and twenty-five cents. 
being a cashier in Walgreens. And then I got a job for $9. I took that. And that was in Hilton Hotel. Oh my God, I was throwing chairs and tables like anything. Those big ballrooms, sometimes you have to set it all by yourself. Break everything down and set it up for the next event. You are flying because you have, you have a spirit that I have to start all over again. You never get tired. And like this, I kept going, like wherever I can find a little bit more money. And I did try to convert my degree. Not try, I did it. I convert the degree I have in India here. And I realize I have to um, do American history and something else. And if I do that, I can become a teacher. And I didn't do that. Okay, I, uh, I, this is what I thought. Okay, I've been a teacher for 10 years. Maybe I, it's time for me to be something else. So to cut it short, it's been more than 10 years now in America. And I do feel that I belong here, now. OK? But where do you actually belong? To just summarize everything, if you ask this question, where do you actually belong? I was in Tibet. I was there in Nepal for a little while. I was there in India for a long time. I'm here in America also for a long time. There is one thing common in all these. There is water, there is food, there is shelter, there is the air that we breathe. These are everywhere. And without these, we cannot survive. That's the common thing. So to put it, To make one single point out of this is, it is the Mother Earth, it is the Mother Earth where we belong. We all are part of the Mother Earth. Even if you try to fly, it's going to attract, attract you back. Whatever you do to it, it always shows you love. So Mother Earth is the one thing that takes care of us. It never gets tired. And Mother Earth, Earth is the only thing who can actually teach us resilience or resistance or whatever. So. Yeah, I think, I think that's pretty much it. So I, what I want to say is, we are all now, the world is becoming small, right? We know what is happening out there. It's, it's, it's in our hands now. So it's high time for us all to be the global citizens. Think globally, act locally. Dalai Lama always says 20th century was the century of war. Who actually won it? Nobody. 21st century should be the century of dialogue. We communicate. OK, you can come down a little bit. I will come up a little bit. In between, we will sort it out. No more war. So that's actually. If that happens in the 21st first century, uh, that's how we pay back to Mother Earth. Because we are not being nice. We are not being nice in any way to Mother Earth. 
and we are living in it. So actually you are just, not you, we are. We are just killing ourselves slowly. And we have to think about your children and your children's children. So, with this note, <laughs> I want to say, I want to conclude here. I hope this is helpful. Thank you. I'll play one song. Do we have time? Okay. I will share with you. Oh, my God.